Chapter 4, Virtue Ethics. Here we have three pictures. The question I want to ask about these pictures is what virtues enable these three things to be excellent? For example, an excellent knife. Well, the answer to that is if you have a racehorse, the thing that makes it an excellent racehorse is its speed. If you have a human eye, the thing that makes it excellence is what the Greeks refer to as clear sightedness, 2020 uh, or better vision in our terminology. The knife, of course, sharpness. If a racehorse is slow, we say it's not a good racehorse. If someone can't see well, we say they have bad eyes. If a knife is not sharp, it's a bad knife. Philosopher J. Budajewski has defined virtue or excellence as a specific quality that enables something to perform its function, its proper work, excellently, so as to achieve its highest good. Going back to the knife illustration, what is it that makes a virtuous knife, if you will, or an excellent knife? Well, it is designed for a purpose, and an excellent knife is a knife that is able to perform its proper function in an excellent fashion so that it achieves its highest good. Uh, the same, Budajewski would argue, is true of human virtue. Virtue is that which enables a human being to perform his or her function or proper work excellently so that that human being achieves its highest good. The authors of our textbook define virtue as moral excellence, righteousness, responsibility, or other exemplary qualities considered meritorious. There's a difference between these two definitions. Budajewski's definition suggested that we human beings, like resources, knives, and eyes, have a purpose for our existence, and it is virtue that enables us to achieve our full potential to become that which we were designed to be, excellent human beings. The authors of our textbook agree that virtue is moral excellence, and qualities that are considered meritorious. They don't tie these qualities to any specific purpose. They have questions as to whether or not it can be conclusively demonstrated that human beings have any purpose or design. And so they make virtue a little more subjective. These are the qualities considered meritorious. Well, this raises a question, uh, considered meritorious by whom? And I would suppose the answer to that would be whatever culture a person happens to be living in. The first definition corresponds to the teaching, the ethical theories of the great Greek philosopher, Aristotle. And we want to talk about him a little bit in this lecture. In virtue ethics, the emphasis is on good or virtuous character, uh, rather than on following a specific set of rules, consequences, uh, feelings. The theory is that if you have people with good character, you're not going to need many rules. If you had perfect people, you wouldn't need any rules at all because you could depend on perfect people to behave ethically, morally, in whatever situation they find themselves in. A virtuous person has an inner cop. That inner cop is there to tell them, don't do that. That's not right. Instead, do the virtuous thing. Do the right thing. But if a person has poor character, they don't have an inner cop. And so they're going to need outer cops to keep them in line. And they're going to need a lot of rules to keep them in line. So the theory is if you have virtuous people, you can have the maximum of freedom in a culture. At least this is the way Aristotle say, saw things. But if people are no longer virtuous, if 
uh, the virtues are lost, uh, then it's not going to be very long before the civilization itself collapses onto the ash heap of history. Uh, certainly that civilization is going to lose its freedom because the absence of virtue in its citizens is going to mean that the society is going to increasingly uh, require tyranny just to maintain order. So in Aristotle's estimation, virtue is a very important thing. Aristotle, Nicomachean Ethics. Nicomachean Ethics is a, a term that is used for Aristotle's virtue ethical system. It was named for his son Nicomachus, and it is based on these tenets. Reality and life are teleological. Now, we talked about that term earlier. That means they are aimed towards some end or purpose. Aristotle believed that life has purpose. The end of life, Aristotle reasoned, is happiness. And reason is the basic activity of all human beings. Therefore, the aim of human beings is to reason well so that they can achieve a complete and happy life. Uh, where did he get this? That the end of human life is happiness. Well, he looked around and said, what is it that most people are seeking? Everyone wants to be happy. No one sets out and says, you know, my goal in life is to be continually unhappy. I want to be miserable. Uh, just the opposite. Uh, human beings are seeking well-being for themselves, and they're seeking happiness. Uh, the observation is, if that is what all human beings seek, it, it must be kind of a pre-programmed end toward which human beings are intended. It is what we strive for. It is therefore uh, the purpose of our existence. Now, as a father, he wanted his son Nicomachus to have a good life, to have a life of happiness. And he looked around and said, you know, the thing that human beings do that kind of sets us apart is we have this incredible ability to reason. And it's basic. It's what human beings do. We're, we're thinking creatures. And he noticed that those who thought well made better choices and thereby achieved a better and more fulfilling life. Something we talked about earlier. You make good choices in life, chances are you're going to have a good life. You make bad choices in life, uh, chances are you're going to have a bad life. And in order to make good choices, you need to think well. You need to be ruled by your mind rather than by your passions. So there's one other item here we need to consider. Aristotle believed that human beings are capable of virtue and that we know it when we see it. So unlike some modern philosophers, he didn't sit around and struggle with the question, what is right and wrong? What is good behavior? This is why sometimes Aristotle is viewed as one of the fathers of natural law theory. Uh, he observed life there in Athens and beyond, and he says, you know, I see virtue as human beings. It's pretty obvious then that human beings are able to achieve virtue. And we know it when we see it, and we admire it when we see it. We don't have to rethink morality because we have an intuitive knowledge of it. And so in this way, he was similar to Kant. Uh, he was similar uh, to those who hold to natural law theory. And again, he is often considered the father of natural law theory. Uh, he would have something in common with Sir David Ross. Aristotle began the, the uh, the implementation, the designing of his moral system by making moral judgments. In this, he was a normative, prescriptive philosopher. He looked around and he noticed those in Athens who were admired, those who were considered role models for the children. And as he observed these people, he noticed that they were living reasonable and virtuous lives. And so from their example, he formulated some general moral principles. 
Aristotle provided us with a list of moral principles, things that he noticed in those worthy of admiration, worthy of imitation, uh, those he saw around him who had achieved virtue. He noted that they contained or they possessed the qualities of courage, self-control, generosity, magnificence, they were high-minded, uh, they were moderate in their ambitions, they were gentle, they were friendly, uh, they were truthful, and they are witty. And as he thought about these things, he developed what he called the doctrine of the mean. Now you hear the word mean, you might think of a, a mean person and use the term as we normally use it in our conversation. But it can also mean the middle, the moderate, the center of the road. He isn't the only one coming up with this. He's not the first to notice that moderation is a better path than extremism. On the other side of the world, you have the Buddha making the same uh, observation. And, and you find this principle in almost all of the world's great religions. But he developed it into an ethical theory based on this idea of the doctrine of the mean. And here's what it is. He noticed that all of the things we consider virtues are the middle path between two extremes. Let's take a, a silly example. Eyebrows. Uh, you have on the left a person with no eyebrows. Not really a good look, and you're going to get a lot of sweat in your eye. On the other side of the screen, you have a person with a, a little too much, uh, more eyebrow than is needed. The bean is just right. It's the Goldilocks principle. Not too cold, not too hot, just right. Uh, not too little eyebrow, not too much eyebrow, just right. The middle way is the better way. And when it comes to morals and ethics, it is the path to good character. This chart helps you to visualize Aristotle's doctrine of the mean. On the left side of the chart, you have certain feelings or actions coming from the feelings that we all are uh, familiar with. Uh, confidence sensual pleasure, shame, giving amusement, telling the truth about yourself, and friendship. Now next to that you have an extreme to the left, rashness. A confidence might be a good thing, rashness might get you killed. This is the person that is taking on necessary risks, perhaps because they're addicted to their own adrenaline. If you've seen the Academy Award-winning film, The Hurt Locker, it features a leader, a squad leader, who is rash, who takes chances, and in doing so puts himself and his men in constant danger. Not a guy you really want to have leading your squad or platoon. Sensual pleasure, profligacy, that is the person who drinks too much, eats too much, uh, just a sexual addict. Shame, you have that bashful person who has trouble even making friends because they are so shy. The buffoon, the buffoon is the clown, the one everyone's laughing at. He is the joke. The buffoon may think people are laughing with him when in fact they are laughing at him. If the buffoon is at, invited to a party at all, it's so that everyone can make fun of him. Uh, boastfulness. The person that goes around bragging on themselves, you know how obnoxious that, is. obnoxious that is. Obsequiousness. That's that person who wants to be your friend, and they just try too hard. Uh, they are just all over you trying to be your friend, and you finally just say, get away from me. You don't want a friend that is fawning all over you, that's trying too hard. Now, Aristotle noticed that people who are rash, profligate, that's hard to say, bashful, buffoons, boastful, and obsequious, he noticed that these individuals really don't have a very happy life. Uh, they're on a path uh, 
to unhappiness at the least, and maybe to total ru a ruin. A rash person, for example, may not have a very long life. The same would be true of a profligate person. A bashful person has no friends, very lonely. The buffoon may figure out eventually that he is the joke, and then uh, he realizes he's a fool and he's a very lonely person. The braggart, uh, you don't invite braggarts to your parties either. It's an obnoxious habit. And the obsequious person is one whom people avoid. They just don't understand how to make friends, and they try too hard. So his advice to his son, Nicomatius, is if you want to be a happy individual, if you want to have a good and fulfilling life, avoid the extremes, the ditch on that side of the middle path. On the opposite side of virtue is another ditch that people fall into, cowardice. Who wants to be a coward? You know, who seeks out cowards to be their friends? Uh, wanting to include at least one coward in our, our, our circle of friendship here. Think of the words of Julius Caesar in Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. The coward dies a thousand times before his death. The brave man dies but once. Uh, cowardice is not something that is going to win you many friends. And again, it's a path to loneliness and unhappiness. Insensibility, that is the person who denies themselves all pleasure. The ascetic, who just, uh, you know, if it tastes good, it must be sin. If it brings a smile to my face, it must be evil. And so, therefore, I'm going to wear a hair vest. I'm going to live as a hermit in a cave. I am going to eat uh, the most plain food I can, perhaps some roots uh, and some, you know, pods off of a tree. And I'm going to live this life of austerity. Well, a person can choose to live that way, but it's not a particularly happy way to live. Uh, with so many good things in this life to enjoy, uh, why does a person choose then to live a life uh, dedicated to the avoidance of all the things in life that are uh, enjoyable? Uh, modesty. You have the bashful person, but you also sometimes have that shameless person. Uh, you know, the, um, the bashful person, perhaps, uh, the bashful woman perhaps dresses uh, with a, a dress that st starts with a covering of the neck, uh, covers down to the uh, wrists, gloves on to cover up the hands, a dress then that loosely fits, goes all the way to the ankles, uh, boots that lace up to the knee. Uh, you, you know, that is the bashful woman there. Then you have the shameless woman. Uh, you know, I wonder if we can think of any modern examples of, of that. Huh. Uh, any number of people. Uh, how about... Uh, Oh, I'm at a loss right now. I, I've put uh, Miley Cyrus out of my mind. Ah, there's the name I was looking for. Uh, sometimes you you look and say, uh, really, you're wearing that? Uh, that is an extreme. That is at least going to destroy your reputation, and who knows where such shameless behavior will lead you. And of course, if you're a celebrity, it can lead you to fame and fortune. Uh, boorishness is the opposite of uh, buffoonery. This person is just a jerk. You know, they they uh, their behavior is just beyond the pale. They seem to have no sense of timing, no sense of discretion. Uh, we today don't use the term bore. We normally speak of such people as jerks, uh, but it's boorish behavior. Boorish behavior is that behavior that makes a person a jerk. Uh, you have, in telling the truth, a boastful person. How about the person that is so self-deprecating? Oh, I'm nothing. I, I am pond scum. I am below all, all other creatures that walk this planet with me. I have no talent. I have no ability. Always putting themselves down. Uh, that gets a little old. And how about that moody person that's always sulky? They may be happy one day. Most of the time, they're just sulking around. 
Aristotle said, well, that side of the ditch isn't very good either. If my son Nicomachus goes that way, uh, hmm, not good. So what should Nicomachus do if he's going to enjoy a, a happy and fulfilling life? He should be reasonable in his behavior and in his moral choices. He should be a man of courage, but not rash or cowardly. He should be a person who is temperate when it comes to sensual pleasure. Uh, again, the principle, the Goldilocks principle, not too hot, not too cold, just right. Modesty, but not to the point of bashfulness, and certainly not shameless. Wittiness. Now, that's the guy you like to invite to your party, the guy that has good timing, the good, appropriate one-liner, uh, wittiness, telling the truth about oneself, that you're honest with oneself and yourself, and you're honest with others. They say, can you sing? And if you sing fairly well, you say, well, yes, I can sing. Are you any good? Yeah, I'm fairly good. Rather than saying, I am the best singer this campus has ever seen. Well, you know, you don't want to go there. Or you're a pretty good singer, but you say, oh, no, no, no. I, 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 just, I just can't do it. Nah, be honest. Uh, friendship, you're a friend. Uh, your behavior is not obsequious. You're not sulking around. Uh, but you are a, a dependable friend with generally stable moods. And you are a peer with those who uh, you befriend. And you do not then fall at the feet of those you want to be your friends and slobber all over their sandals. So, uh, this is the doctrine of the mean. Uh, the Buddhists talked about the middle way. Coincidentally, uh, so does Aristotle here. It's not really coincidentally. This is just good common sense. Now, Aristotle believed that the way to maintain a free society is to model the virtues, to celebrate the virtues, and to aspire towards the virtues. So it's kind of a, a, a break with the, the thinking of Homeric Greece, which you are, what you do. And his idea was you can actually do something about that. Uh, you can cultivate the virtues. Uh, it's never too late, your life not going well, chances are you have fallen off to one side of the ditch or the other. But if you walk this middle path, and if the culture walks that path with you, then you are going to be able to have that which they cherished so, they cherished so much in uh, Greece, the maximum possible freedom. For people who model the middle way. You don't need many rules and you don't need many cops because you can depend on them to do uh, the right thing, the moral thing, the ethical thing, and pretty much any situation in which they find themselves. We now go to the other side of the world and we meet an individual by the name of uh, Confucius. Actually, uh, his name, as was pronounced in China, was Kung Zi. How the Jesuits got Confucius out of Kung Zi is one of those great mysteries. Uh, Confucius also had a virtue ethical theory. And so we're going to talk about the Confucian model of self-cultivation. And I think it is helpful to know something about the life of Confucius uh, to put his moral theories in perspective and also to help you see how he arrived at his conclusions. Confucius was born in the year 551 BC. It was a time when China had broken apart from an empire into a number of small feudal kingdoms. And overall, the situation was not good. According to tradition, Confucius was born into a once noble family. But things were not going well in the kingdom they were a part of, and so it was necessary for Confucius and his family to flee to the state of Lu, 
So his first memory in life would be uh, being a refugee. I've often looked at these children we see on TV, refugees, and wondering how this experience of being a refugee is going to impact them for the rest of their life. It's going to do that, you know. Uh, that sort of experience cannot help but influence you in significant ways, ways that are going to be noticed throughout the rest of your time on this planet. And I think that Confucius's experience impacted him. You see, a great oriental virtue is harmony. You see this in the, uh, the religious system known as Taoism, the idea of living in harmony with nature and imitating the harmony of nature. Well, the China of Confucius's childhood was not a harmonious society. Some kingdoms were better than others. Lu was better than the kingdom from which his family had fled. But overall, China was a quilt uh, made up of patches of cloth of varying quality. Some good, some not so good. No sooner had the family arrived in Lu than Confucius's father died. And so you have a mother with a young child living in a place without a social safety net, having left family and friends behind. Uh, not many options for a woman in that situation. She could beg. Uh, she could send her child out into the street to beg for her. I've been in a country, spent a lot of time in a country where this is a common thing. You'll see a mother standing at a distance while a little child will approach you rubbing his stomach, uh, signaling that he needs food, and holding out his hands asking for some money. Uh, a very sad situation. If you've seen the Academy, Academy Award winning film Slumdog Millionaire, you've seen that some people will maim children actually buy children, use them as a slave for begging purposes, maim or injure them so that they will evoke more sympathy. Uh, this sort of thing goes on. But Confucius's mother was not going to do that. Well, she could be a prostitute. Well, she wasn't going to go that route either. Well, what did that leave her? Well, she could take whatever jobs she could find and work herself to a bone. Because the untimely death of Confucius's father had reduced the family to poverty. Uh, she took the only moral choice available to her and she went to work. But she was a woman with great ambition for her son. And even though they were living in a state of poverty, his mother was determined to educate him and raise him to be a gentleman. And so she hired whatever tutor she could. She made it possible for him to take whatever lessons she could afford to give him so that he would be raised as a gentleman and not as a street urchin. So as a child, he enjoyed activities such as riding, archery. A cultivated gentleman uh, was somehow acquainted with the fine arts and he learned to play the lute and more importantly, he learned. And in his teenage years, he began to take his studies seriously. Uh, he fell in love with learning and he had as his ambition to become a scholar. In the course of time, he had obtained enough education to get a job that provided him with a good income. He became a tax collector. Well, this enabled him to support his mother, and there was enough left for him to continue to pursue his studies. Now, being a tax collector was not a job that won you a lot of friends. Then as now, uh, tax collectors are <laughs> were not invited to a lot of parties, except parties held by other tax collectors. That's all right. Confucius was working on becoming a scholar. I don't know if he had a lot of friends or not. The stories don't tell us. But what is important is mom no longer had to work. 
Uh, she had poured her life into him, worked herself to a bone for him. And now he was in a position to give back to this woman who had done so much for him. And he did so. He took care of his mother until her death. She died in his late teens. And he observed the prescribed time of mourning, the veneration of ancestors and the proper mourning of ancestors is a very important thing in Chinese culture. The death of his mother enabled him to take a chance. While she was alive, he needed the income. But now he could try his hand at something he wanted to do. He could become a teacher. And that was risky in those days because, you know, if you were a bad teacher, uh, you didn't get paid or you didn't get paid very much because there was no public school system. I mean, you, you were hired by people to tutor their sons. Daughters were not uh, factored into the educational equation at that particular time in human history and, and certainly not in China. So uh, wealthy people would hire you to tutor their children. If you were good, you got a good reputation, you had more people hiring you, you might even have your own school. Uh, Confucius then was taking a risk. Would he have a good income? Would he have a, a small income? It turned out he had a very good income. It turned out he was a very good teacher. He was a successful teacher. And what this means is his uh, those who attended his school, those who were tutored by him, did very well. Many of them uh, achieved great success, many of them in government. And so people would begin to notice, man, uh, this young man is a, an outstanding young man. Who taught him? Oh, Confucius. So Confucius was in demand, and that meant his income was good. He was very successful. He was building a reputation. But he was also a thinking man, and he was developing a political theory, a theory that he hoped could bring harmony back to the divided China. Uh, that had impacted him in such a significant way as a child and as a young man. So he began to aspire to be a part of government himself. And our author says for a time he may have actually served as a high government official. Uh, it seems very likely that he did. And in that role, his political theory was put into practice and it worked. Other neighboring states saw it working and they imitated it. And it became a political theory that came to dominate Chinese thought. It reunified the culture and it did indeed produce harmony. Now in Athens, the great cultural value is freedom, individuality. In the Orient, harmony and the community and the collective are the great value. Uh, but both systems see virtue as the key to achieving a, a good society, though what a good society is, is defined differently uh, by the Greeks in the West and by Confucian, the Chinese, and generally the cultures of the Orient. At some point after he became successful, Confucius took a wife. This makes sense. He couldn't support a wife, but certainly not when he was taking that chance. Uh, but once he had succeeded, he then took a wife. Uh, apparently was a good husband. He's reported to have had both a son and a daughter. At some point, uh, apparently the wife is no longer in the equation. Perhaps she died, the children are raised, and Confucius, because he is a lifelong learner and because he has mastered uh, just about everything you can learn in Lu, wants to travel. It's a great way to learn. And so he was absent from Lu for about 15 years, traveling around, learning what he could. In his old age, he returned and his ideas had worked well. He was celebrated. He was giving, given a largely ceremonial post as a senior advisor uh, to the emperor. He died about uh, 478 
BC. So let's uh, analyze his life. First of all, he lived in a tumultuous time. The old feudal system, even, you know, the empire broken down into a feudal system, and the feudal system itself was breaking down. And this was resulting in significant disorder in the society. And this disorder affected families and individuals. Importantly, Confucius himself had been a victim of the disorder, uh, though his mother was not the kind of woman who would allow him to see himself as a victim. You're going to you're going to overcome. You are going to be a cultivated gentleman. You're going to be a somebody if I have to work myself to death to achieve it. And and she pretty much did. Uh, so he knew about that. He was impacted by it and naturally uh, sensitive to it at both an intellectual and an emotional level. Confucius was one of those individuals who had the rare ability to step outside of his times and analyze things. Uh, he knew something was wrong. Everyone knew what was wrong and who knows what was being tried uh, to fix the problems. Uh, we can imagine that people were trying, as they are in our day and time, to deal with the symptoms. But Confucius came to believe that society would only be fixed and proper functionally if the old virtues were taught and lived. Go back to Aristotle. We can maintain freedom as long as the virtues are taught, modeled, celebrated. Uh, Okay, Confucius in China was living in a time when those old virtues had no longer been celebrated. They were not being modeled. Uh, they were not being uh, held up before the people of China, the various states of China, as that towards which we ought to aspire. Society had fallen apart and was falling apart. Confucius says, you know what? That's because we are no longer a virtuous society. And if we're going to fix it, we need to start teaching and living the virtues again. So he had two great ideas. He wanted to produce excellent individuals who could then become leaders of society. Like Aristotle, he said it's possible for people to be virtuous. Uh, how did he know that? Well, uh, because of his mother, he had become that. And the goal of virtue is to produce that which had been lost, a harmonious society. Now, he believed these two ideas were complementary. Virtuous individuals would create a harmonious society, and then a harmonious society would produce virtuous individuals. You see the, the Taoist idea of the yin and the, and the yang here, uh, that... Uh, are going to create a, a perpetual motion machine. If you have virtuous individuals living and teaching the virtues, then you are going to create a harmonious society. And such a society is going to be reproducing itself over and over again. And so it will continue. And it did continue in, in China for over a thousand years. That's something that about Confucius that kind of sets him apart from other moral philosophers. A lot of them have ideas about what society should be when those societies are implemented or someone makes an attempt to implement them, despite the fact that they sound so good on paper, they don't work very well in the real world. But here's a political philosopher who came up with an idea that worked, and it worked well in a particular culture. Confucius believed, as Aristotle, that we're capable of being refined and great, but he believed we could not do this in isolation from others. We couldn't do it on our own. And here I, I think you see a little bit of Confucius's biography coming into play. In class, I ask my students, what, how do you think he got that idea? And they'll sit there, first of all, oh, he's going to ask me a question. I don't know that I know the answer. So I, I say, nothing, nothing. think. And before long, a light bulb will go on and say, his mother. Absolutely correct, in my opinion. Uh, this is my analysis, but uh, certainly it makes sense. Confucius could look at himself. He could have been a street urchin. They were in abject poverty. But he turned out to be a cultivated gentleman 
greatly influential in his particular society. He was refined, and he could modestly say, I have even achieved greatness here. Uh, people view me that way. But he was wise enough to realize that it was not something he could have accomplished on his own had it not been for a mother pouring herself into him. None of this could have been achieved. So Confucius believed that a person could only become a great person, a virtuous person, through the contribution of others. And then through fulfilling their obligation to others as well. Think again of the biography. His mother had poured him, herself into him, but there came a time when he was able to put himself in a position to then pour himself into her, making her last year's uh, comfortable. And as a teacher, he had poured himself into his students, and they had reciprocated. And so it continues, yin and yang, round and round it goes. I contributing to others, others contributing back and others. And so society is fixed, and so harmony is restored, and so harmony is perpetual. The goal of Confucian thought is to move the individual from being that ordinary person to being that excellent person. And Confucius believed this was to be done through the cultivation of virtue and intellect. There is a, a way in which he kind of broke from the Taoist tradition. Uh, the Taoist tradition, somewhat suspicious of formal education, Confucius believed in it. And he believed to have a fully cultivated person, you had to have a two-pronged educational system, if you will. You had to educate the intellect. That's important. But he realized, as C.S. Lewis would say, that if you educate the intellect but not the virtues, you end up with clever devils. And there were enough clever devils in China in its, uh, uh, its chaotic state, and many of them had managed to become rulers of various uh, feudal kingdoms. And so he says, we need more than smart people. We need virtuous people. We have to educate both. This is from a textbook on religion by Mike Malloy. I am using information from that again because I think the biography of Confucius is important to understand his system. Malloy writes, Confucius valued education because it transmitted the lessons of the past into the present. He believed that much of the wisdom required to produce excellent human beings is already expressed in the teachings of the great leaders of the past. Convinced that the past provides fine models for the present, Confucius thought that education could show the way to wide and happy living. Very similar to... Uh, uh, to Aristotle in its ultimate goal, wide and happy living. How can we do that? Well, we look to the past. So China has a moral cri a crisis in the opinion of Confucius. What do we do? Well, unlike moral philosophers of our day, he doesn't say we need to come up with a new moral theory. He says he used to work what went wrong? Oh, we're not doing what they did in the past. We are no longer living and modeling and teaching the virtues. We got smart people, but we have people without virtue. And so what we need to fix the mass is we need to go back to those wise teachers of the past and we need to begin to teach the ancient virtues again. So Confucius is not proposing a new moral theory, theory, but a moral revival. Malloy continues. Moreover, Confucius saw civilization as a complicated and fragile creation. Because of this, he believed that 
Civilized human beings must be full of respect and care. Care must be given to the young who will continue human life on earth and to the elders who teach and pass on the traditions. There should be a reverence for everything valuable that has been brought from earlier generations. I have a great love for the Oriental culture because they do value tradition and they do value their elders. Now that I'm getting to be an older man, I kind of appreciate that emphasis. Uh, I didn't appreciate it that much when I was young, but I like it now. And they recognize that though everything in the past was not gold, that many of the things in the past were indeed gold and better than the cheap plastic imitations of what was to them the modern age. Of course, they didn't have plastic, but you get the point. Uh, I like this idea that Confucius understood the fragility of civilization. To illustrate this, I ask my students to imagine I'm holding this huge crystal ball, but it is uh, it is not solid. In fact, it is a crystal that is very much like a soap bubble. Uh, inside is a hollow uh, area. And it is so valuable because it is so unique and so fragile. So I'm handling it with kid gloves. And then I ask the students to imagine, now it's your turn. I'm going to give this to you. And some of the students really play along with this. And once I put it in their hands, I say, oh, you handled it too roughly. It all fell apart. Uh, that's kind of Confucius's idea of civilization. Man, it's a fragile thing. Uh, as he has a plan to put things back together and restore harmony, he recognizes it wouldn't take much to screw the whole thing up again, to break it all apart. It's a fragile thing, so we have to handle civilization with care. It's complicated. It's fragile. So we have to treat everyone with care. The young have to be treated with great care. They're going to continue life on earth, and they're going to continue in their generation to, to hold this fragile crystal bubble that we're passing on to them. And so we have to teach them how to handle it. And we need to teach them a reverence for the traditions of the past, the valuable things that have been brought forward from previous generations. Well, now let's return to our ethics textbook and talk about Confucius's model for self-cultivation. The Chinese term de means virtue, and it is the inherent tendency to affect others in a positive, dramatic, and powerful way for good. Now, perhaps growing up you had uh, some friends and your mom or your dad thought that that person is a bad influence on you. We really don't want you to run around with that person. Uh, the problem there is that person lacked day. They had a powerful influence. They affected you, but not in a positive and powerful way for good. Uh, they had a positive and powerful, or negative and powerful and dramatic uh, ability to influence you in the wrong direction. But on the other hand, your parents might have really liked some of your friends because they saw in them virtue. And they would say, this is the person we want you to hang around because they have a, the ability to affect you in a positive, dramatic, and powerful way for good. A little bit of Confucian moral advice is take a look at your friends. You will be influenced by them. Are they affecting you in a, for good or are they affecting you for bad? If they're affecting you for bad, uh, perhaps you consider should consider making some new friends. A uh, little Confucian wisdom. In the Confucian world, one's identity is tied to the group and to the relationships that person has within the social order. Chinese culture, Oriental culture, as we've said, is not an individualistic culture. It is a uh, culture that is uh, committed to harmony uh, more so than individual freedom. A Chinese saying, it's the nail that stands up that gets hammered. And so you want to accept your role within the group, the collective, 
is uh, needs you to function your proper role within the group. But it is within the group that you find your identity, where you fit. This in mind, the Confucian model isolates or directs our attention to five cardinal relationships. All Confucian virtues are carried out within the context of these relationships, and they're governed by reciprocity. What's that? It's what we talked about earlier. I'm going to pour into you, and you're going to pour into me. And so we got this yin and yang thing going as uh, we are building virtue into one another within the context of the relationships of life. The first relationship is the ruler-subject relationship. In the Confucian model, rulers really are public servants. Uh, they are uh, pouring virtuous things, carrying out their duties and responsibilities to their subjects, and the subject in response is uh, giving back reverence and honor, taxes, all of those things that a ruler is entitled to, given the fact that they are providing such good leadership in the culture. Father, son, and here we have primarily in mind the older son. In many cultures, the older son has a, a special place by virtue of his birth order. And in the Confucian system, the father has a special responsibility to that older son uh, to mentor him because he is going to be the leader of the family when the father is no longer able to have that role. He is going to be the primary heir of the father. And so the father is going to pour himself into the son, and the son is going to reciprocate. Now, Confucius had this going in a mother-son relationship that was kind of unique because he did not have the father to do this. Um, but as a father, uh, he would endeavor to uh, mentor his older son. In, in a oriental culture, there would be the mentoring process uh, for the daughters uh, from the mothers, though this isn't specifically mentioned by Confucius, but the mother would be the mentor of the daughters, preparing them for their role in the culture. Then there's the husband-wife relationship. The husband has responsibilities to the wife. The wife has responsibilities to the husband, both of them fulfilling their responsibilities. There is harmony in the home. The elder brother, who has been mentored by the father, then mentors the younger brothers. And so you have that. The younger brothers accept the position that he has as the firstborn, and uh, they accept the mentoring, and then they get back to honor uh, and fulfill their responsibilities to the elder brother. And there is only one relationship in the Confucian model that is would be of complete equals, and that would be the friend to friend. Uh, we understand that there is a responsibility that comes with friendship. It's on spoken. We don't have a, a list of rules. This is what you must be if you're going to be my friend. But we kind of know when someone breaks the rule. For example, most of us can think of a time when someone knifed us in the back and they're no longer our friend because of that. They, they broke the rules. Or perhaps you knife someone in the back and you're no longer their friend. It, it can work both ways. Uh, but we understand that there are our responsibilities to, within friendship. And in the Confucian model, it is uh, that uh, that factor of, of uh, being that positive influence for good. Uh, you give back D. They give D. And together, then, uh, you are achieving virtue together uh, from the Old Testament or the uh, Tanakh. You have the the proverb that says, uh, "Iron as what iron sharpens iron, so is one man sharpened by his uh, friend. And that same concept. Uh, together we become sharper as a result of this friendship. The goal of Confucianism is harmony. To achieve that, you have not only the need for day, but you need Ren. And is one of the Confucian virtues. It means human-heartedness, benevolence, goodness, humaneness. 
and it is the chief of the Confucian virtues. Uh, leaders should be full of Ren. Uh, human heartedness, benevolence, goodness, uh, humanness, because although this is not a Chinese saying, uh, the Chinese recognize that a fish rots from the head down. And so it was important that the leaders be full of Ren. Uh, this highlights and enhances those natural relationships we looked at within the community. Uh, the idea of being one with others. Uh, as we strive for Ren in all of our relationships, we see the development of harmony or the reestablishment of harmony in the case of the Confucian world. Another Confucian virtue is Li. Ri is defined as ritual propriety. You could leave the word ritual out. It's just propriety. It's a virtue and virtue uh, to know how to behave in particular situations. What is proper, what's improper. You behave one way when you are in the presence of the emperor. You would behave another way when you're with your friend. Uh, it would not be appropriate for you to behave the way you do with your friend when you are in the presence of the emperor. And a wise person knows what is proper given the circumstance, given the relationship uh, they find themselves in. Lee makes it possible for an individual to exhibit appropriate conduct then in specific situations. A sense of propriety. As we look at our culture, many have noted that we, uh, we are losing our sense of propriety. What is proper, what is improper. Uh, Confucius would look at that with some alarm and say, you guys are really headed for trouble. You don't even know what's proper and improper anymore. Your culture lacks Lee. Idealistic and realistic conceptions of Confucianism. We're going to introduce you to two disciples of Confucius. First of all is Mingzi. The Jesuits came up with Mincius. Uh, kind of Latinized it there. Mingzi had a view of human nature that would probably be very widely accepted in our day and time. Confucius, of course, recognized that people are capable of virtue, and Mingzi believed that human beings are predisposed towards it, that we have a natural disposition towards goodness. And so what we need to do is cultivate that natural tendency towards goodness, water it so that virtue sprouts out of that fertile soil of basic human goodness. So Mingzi would agree with the proposition that we hear these days that people are basically good. Uh, he would say exactly so. And so in educating the young, uh, we do not uh, need to be harsh. We treat them like a gentle plant, cultivating, encouraging, watering. He would be into positive reinforcement as opposed to negative reinforcement. On the other side of the spectrum, we have Kungzi. Kungzi taught that human beings are not naturally disposed towards goodness. Uh, he would have made a good Calvinist. He believed in innate depravity. He believed that human nature is evil and must be overcome the way one would straighten a crooked piece of wood or the way someone would sharpen a piece of metal on a grinder. The rough edges need to be rubbed off because we have a natural disposition, not towards goodness, we resist goodness. We don't want to be good. Uh, we want to be selfish. We want to be egoethicists. And he said that tendency must be overcome. It must be straightened so that we are willing to accept our role within the harmonious society uh, so that we reject individualism in favor of subordinating ourselves for the good of the collective. Uh, two views of human nature. 
perhaps you could uh, synthesize and say that human beings are very interesting. We're capable of goodness and virtue. We're also capable of extraordinary evil. And so maybe Solzhenitsyn was right when he suggested that the line between good and evil runs through the heart, right down the center of every single human being. Now we come to Confucian role ethics. Kaiao means family reverence, family feeling. And it is the root of consummate con uh, conduct. Family feeling is something that you begins in the family, but then it extends throughout the entire culture. And it is the basis for all of those Conf Confucian virtues. The authors say that Confucian role ethics is a new type of ethical theory. Well, it's kind of hard for me to say that something that was uh, proposed 2,400 years ago is a new ethical theory. It seems quite ancient to me. Um, but I think what they have in mind it here is that we in the West have not been terribly open to non-Western ideas. We've sometimes had the attitude, we've generally had the attitude that the, the rest of the world has nothing to teach us. And because of the legacy of colonialism, we moved into places like China and we didn't respect the fact that the Chinese had an older culture than we did. Uh, they were inferior to us, or so we thought. And so we didn't really have a desire to learn much from them. Uh, so the idea that we would look back at Confucius and say, this Chinese wise man has something to teach us is kind of a new attitude. So it is new in that sense. It is, as the authors say, very distinct from what we've been talking about. We talked about consequentialism and non-consequentialism. But all the ethical theories say, let's set that aside. Let's focus instead on character because virtuous individuals can be dependent upon to behave virtuously in any situation in which they find themselves. The authors note there's no equivalent ethical theory in the Western tradition. And that, that's true because uh, Confucianism, being Oriental, places its role on accepting the role you are born into or you find yourself in at a particular moment in uh, your journey through life. And the authors say we need to understand Confucianism on its own terms. Certainly, it will not be something that you could bring straight aside, in, uh, straight into uh, the uh, West. Uh, because we are so individualistic that the idea of accepting a role and subordinating our individualism would not probably fly too well here. Uh, in its own culture, though, it produced a culture of ethic responsibility. Uh, particular persons within a matrix of role relationships with others it worked, still works in Japan. Uh, one of the things you would notice if you went to Japan is they don't have as many police officers as we do. They have inner cops, so they don't need as many outer cops. That's kind of the way virtue ethics works. 